20 seconds and you can start talking then. All righty. I think we are live. Um, hello, everyone. I hope there are people out there who are uh, watching us and listening to us. But of course, this is going to be a video uh, hosted on Facebook and on YouTube so that you can watch us later as well. My name is Levan Tepoliak, and I would like to welcome you for Cooperative City in Quarantine uh, fourth edition, where we will talk about community centers, spaces that serve uh, host NGOs, serve for hosting community events and all kinds of civil society activities. We actually invited uh, a number of municipalities and uh, activists from the ground from six cities, six cities that are participating in the Urbeck Network Active NGOs. So we are very lucky to have with us Irina Vasilyeva from Riga, who's an Active NGOs project coordinator. So she's actually taking care of uh, bringing together, holding together the whole network. We have Petra Marcinko from Dubrovnik, who's coordinating the local uh, civil society stakeholder group. We have Tom Goodridge, uh, who's the community engagement officer from the Brighton and Hove City Council. We have Jackie Rana, who's a trustee of Belta, that is Bristol Estate Leaseholders and Tenants Association uh, in Brighton. We have Mark Bassos, uh, who's a ULG coordinator in Santa Pola. Uh, in Spain, we have Maria Tilikala, who's an NGO cooperation coordinator in ESPO, Finland. And we have Katerina Timparano, who's a ULG coordinator from uh, Syracuse, Italy, Sicily. She is not uh, at the moment able to join us, but we hope we can solve this uh, during the call. So I hope that we will have her on board at some point. So um, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation. You are, represent a great variety of cities across Europe. So we often say that we're all together in this COVID-19 and uh, we kind of think that every city has a more or less similar situation, but it would be really nice to hear a little bit of you. Uh, if you could share us where you are now, uh, what is behind you? Are you at home? Are you in an office? And what is the situation in your city right now? Maybe we can start with Irina. Uh, hi, my name is Irina. I come from Riga, Latvia, and here I represent Riga and Joe House. If we look at the situation with coronavirus, uh, we are uh, we have a state of emergency which was prolonged till the 12th of May. Uh, it's not very strict here. We are allowed to go to work. So half of the time I work from the office, half of the time I work from home. And the number of cases we have, uh, we have at the moment is 577 cases. And we are trying to keep uh, the distance, which maybe it's not so difficult in our uh, mental conditions uh, to have two meters between people and trying, of course, to wash hands and to be on the safe side and still trying to work uh, in our Riga and Joe house. Thanks a lot, Irina. Petra, what is the situation where you are now? Um, well, first, hello from the oldest quarantine in the world. In, uh, I'm here at the Lazarity Complex, uh, which is now a sociocultural center or community center. Uh, we are doing actually very well, uh, both in Dubrovnik and in Croatia. I think we have around 60 cases in Dubrovnik that are confirmed uh, to give it on a scale of uh, 40,000 uh, residents in Dubrovnik. So that's quite an all right number. We have some stricter measures, but the majority of the citizens are doing very well and they are really abiding to these uh, measures and they are really abiding to, to these restrictions. And we have a lot of citizens who um, uh, join the civil protection, who goes around uh, in districts and makes sure that everything is okay and all right. So we take care of each other. Thanks a lot. Tom, how, is, how are things in Brighton and Hove? Uh, so I'm, my name is Tom Goodridge. Um, I work as community engagement officer at Brighton Hove City Council. Um, I'm working from home. Um, I've been uh, self-isolating now for 15 days. Um, I contracted coronavirus myself. Uh, thankfully, I'm over the um, I'm over the effects of that, and thankfully, it was very mild. Um, in the UK, we have upwards of 60,000 cases. 
um, and, and, and a thousand, a few, thousands of deaths, unfortunately. Uh, and um, I mean, I think in Europe, it's been quite widely uh, noted the the UK's maybe slow perceived um, steps taken in terms of social distancing and lockdown. Um, but in, in a city, in a city level, I think it's been very strong. Um, and I think particularly from the um, kind of NGO and more grassroots sector, um, we've been overwhelmed by the acts of kindness um, and c creativity and compassion. So we see actually a lot of good news as well, besides the overwhelmingly bad news. Jackie, would you like to add something? Are, are you in the same neighborhood? Of course, you're not. You haven't met each other for a while, I guess, especially Tom. I, I mean, it's very... Uh, you know, sad to hear that you contracted the virus, but we're very happy to see that you're you're over. So, are you in the same neighborhood? Are you kind of in touch these days? Um, hi, I'm Jackie Rana. I'm from Belta, um, and that's located in East Brighton. Um, yes, I do have some contact with Tom. Um, I mean, naturally. Uh, He's been taking time to, to recover. So it's been online, you know, emails, etc. cetera, um, just checking in. In terms of the community, I'm one of the acting trustees. So I think Belta, like other um, areas, uh, suddenly the members of the community found themselves with relatively little warning, having to social distance, self-isolate, um, there's quite a few vulnerable members of the residents in on Bristol Estate, so it was really, uh, it's really been sort of a, a reactive approach, um, very quickly repurposing what we do and trying to respond to the crisis. Yeah, thanks. We'll get back to to this. Um, maybe Ma Mark, are you in Santa Paula or where are you at the moment? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is is Mark, and I am. I represent the city of, of Santa Pola, uh, Santa Pola, which is uh, in the Mediterranean uh, coastal, uh, it's a Mediterranean coastal town in the southeast of, of Spain. And uh, in this moment, we don't have uh, data at the very local uh, level, but as uh, you know, the, the situation in Spain is, is quite worrying. It's uh, complicated with more than 140,000 cases. Uh, it's a, a difficult uh, situation. And we are all working and uh, confined at home, and the economic activity is limited to uh, the essential uh, activities. So the next week uh, seems to be very crucial to slow down uh, the path, and uh, we will see. We're still at home, uh, at least until uh, until the end of this uh, this month. Yeah, we've been following uh, very worriedly the news from Spain, and and also of course from Italy. Unfortunately, Caterina couldn't make it technologically to, to join us, but uh, we, we can maybe later on give a little bit of an input from what's happening in Sicily, in Syracuse, if she sends us some, some details. Katerina, if you still listen to us, you can uh, join us on the Facebook Live and you can leave us some, some messages and comments and questions there. Maria, are you in ESPO? How is in ESPO? I think Finland was doing relatively well so far. Mm -hmm. What's the yeah. situation? Well, actually, I'm not in Espo at the moment. I'm in Helsinki, where I live. I also am not leaving my home at the moment, so I haven't been in Espo also like in maybe over two weeks, almost three weeks now, I think. So most of us work from home, uh, both in NGO side and, and the city sector. Um, um, and uh, well, we have quite uh, strict restrictions as well here in Finland. Mm, and we are not allowed to leave our uh, region. So the Uusima, uh, the capital uh, and capital area and areas surrounding it is uh, a one region, and we are not allowed to leave. So there's also this re restriction Collective because uh, most of the cases are in this capital area at the moment. There's in Finland now, uh, I think almost two thousand. Uh, and 500 cases and in Espo there is now I checked just the, today's number is 251 cases in Espo but it's almost uh, it's over double in Helsinki so I'm not in the safest, safest place to be in Finland at the moment but uh, there hasn't been that many 
uh, bad cases yet. Most are quite mild and and we are really lucky in that way that our healthcare system is still carrying out and the strict restrictions will be uh, held at least until the middle of May. Some also to the early summer months here. And here as well, there has been a lot of these solitary movements. People are really coming together, even though they're not, they're not allowed to be physically together. And it's been I mean, many people are saying that, oh, well, there's something good from this virus that people feel maybe more close and actually neighbors talk to each other. And it's not not something that happens in Finland a lot. If you meet a neighbor somewhere, they will talk to you. So maybe people really feel that we are in this together and it's our common goal to be this and support each other. Okay, thanks a lot, Maria. Yeah. Also, just to ex explain you or share with you. So I'm in Budapest right now, and it's been, uh, I mean, it's been relatively mild, uh, not so restricted. I mean, we have, in theory, kind of a limitation in going out, but uh, many people expect that today or tomorrow there will be announcement of more strict uh, uh, limitations. This is also because the good weather has arrived and people are really going out too much in, in, in groups that they should not do. And also what we see that uh, there's a concentration in Budapest of cases and with the long weekend arriving, uh, there's a lot of people fear that a lot of people would actually go out in the countryside and spread uh, the virus around. So there's been a lot of discussions about this. Also, we have a unpleasant uh, by effect of the crisis is that uh, uh, our government uh, announced a state of emergency where the government took actually a lot of uh, responsibilities and capacities from municipalities as well. So they created a, a legislatory system that they can override local rules that leaves municipalities very unequipped to deal with the situation locally. So everybody ends up uh, in the in the in you know exposed to the mercy of the government, which is not usually a very good situation. We see maybe in many places that uh, devolution of responsibilities can be actually very good when there's locally handled uh, 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 solutions or, or answers to the crisis. So this is something that we also have to deal with now because we all work with cities and municipalities. So our questions that we've been already in the last editions discussed with Tom and others is that uh, what is the role of municipalities in this situation? No? How much space do they have to move around uh, when dealing with these issues and when you know acting in the shadow of municipalities? And of course, Urbex as such as a, as a program that deals with municipalities. So our project here, Active NGOs, deals with spaces for NGOs and civil society, and also uh, to a certain extent, uh, the social and solidarity economy. So maybe what we could talk about now is a little bit to see what are the spaces we talk about? Because the big question now with this lockdown situation, with the, the, the evaporation of social co contact, at least phys physical contact, also many of these spaces uh, find themselves in difficulties, no? Because community spaces by definition are places where people gather, where people create relationships when they you know, meet each other. And what's happening when we're, we're not capable of doing this, no? So maybe I would give again the words to Irina because she represents uh, uh, Riga where uh, our story, our joint story starts with the NGO house of Riga. If you can tell us a few words about the NGO house in Riga. Uh, yeah, so I'm representing Riga NGO house. It's a municipality structure. Actually, it's a former building of a school uh, which was, is now given uh, both to non-governmental organizations and to a cultural center. So it's the space uh, where in normal life NGOs can come, can use different premises, can make different activities, can do networking activities. Uh, also, this is the place where municipality is helping them to get new knowledge about the topics they're interested in, uh, accountants, communication and other issues. So it's like a community hub in one of the parts of uh, Riga city. Uh, the building is quite big and usually it's inhabited by many, many, many NGOs. Uh, and uh, since the emergency situation has been announced on the 13th of March, 
at first we were, were uh, supposed to stay in lockdown for one month and now it has been prolonged for one more month till the 12th of March. Uh, no one knew what to do. And uh, for example, on the 19th of March, uh, uh, there were, there were uh, consultations uh, planned so NGOs could come and uh, ask different questions about accountants, about uh, uh, communication and other issues. And uh, actually it uh, uh, showed us that we were, on one hand, we were not prepared for the situation, but on the other hand, we were prepared for the situation. So uh, it was just a couple of days afterwards when the um, state of emergency was announced. And uh, so there were a sort of live consultations using phone, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, uh, emails, uh, and trying to answer different questions uh, which were topicable for NGOs. And, um, but since that time, we managed to readapt to the local situation. And now we are learning different online platforms. And uh, for example, on the 2nd of April, uh, there was a first uh, Facebook Live seminar on accountancy uh, because now for uh, non-governmental organizations of Latvia, they need to produce uh, annual report for the state revenue uh, office and it's the, the highest uh, priority for them, how, what should do and how do we do it. And it was quite a big success. Everyone was nervous. Uh, Facebook didn't work well when it was needed, but it was, it was okay. And now we are having tomorrow a next seminar with the wonderful communication expert. And the topic is how to use different communication platforms in the online life. So after we announced the information about the seminar, all 50 places were occupied within a couple of hours. Uh, so therefore, we're making another one on the 15th of April uh, to help uh, people to readapt. But uh, we cannot say that we have less work at the moment. We will have an even more work, uh, same as all of you. We're going to online, uh, online life and we're already tired of all these online meetings. Uh, it's good that it's possible at least to see each other. But um, uh, what we experience is that uh, people are lost. Uh, they are in a very uncomfortable situation and they're calling us, they're asking what to do. And in many cases, we are providing them a mental support uh, about how to survive, what to do, how to plan their activities. And uh, sometimes when you analyze, uh, the person was on call with you for 50 minutes. When you analyze the call, like 10 minutes was of uh, content and other 40 minutes, uh, it was uh, a mental and moral support to NGOs helping them to readapt and the people feel happy and they're all the time in touch. The amount of emails, the amount of Skype calls actually has tripled and uh, we're working even more now. But then you, you are affirming your position in the community. So you, you are an indispensable institution for NGOs and for, for the community yes. locally. Yes, Which it's is good very that important. we are supported by municipality uh, from the budget of municipality, everything is paid. Uh, the only thing we can do, uh, we cannot do at the moment is to allow people to come and to mix. Uh, uh, but uh, we're trying to already plan, for example, till the, to the middle of May, we are in the lockdown. But uh, for the second part of May, we have plan A and plan B. We're planning both online activities and we're also planning face to face activity in case we can do them. Uh, it's clear that the summer will not be as a usual summer, uh, but it will not be a very big holiday period for us. So we're also planning something also for the middle, for the beginning of June. And of course, autumn is already full with the activities which were postponed from spring. And how do you see, because we've been talking about digitalization now and moving some of the activities into the online space, but this situation has forced all of us to find our communication you know, channels and methods and networks online. Did you see, was it a smooth transition for your local community? Uh, well, it wasn't definitely a smooth uh, transition. We have another activity, for example, of uh, Riga City Council. We have uh, Latvian language courses for the inhabitants of Riga. And uh, so at the beginning, when the first uh, lockdown period was announced, we didn't know what to do. So how do we do? Do we wait when it is finishing or uh, what, how do, should we react? But now our all uh, partners which are implementing this project and providing uh, free Latvian language courses for the inhabitants of Riga, they are gradually moving to this online uh, learning. 
and uh, it's uh, also uh, I think, think the biggest problem is not the technology okay you can go to online seminar you can learn about them but to change the uh, way of thinking the mentality for example what I heard from the teachers uh, which are uh, learning online of for Latin language courses, they're saying that there was a, at the beginning there was resistance from people. No, we don't want this. Why do we do it? Why we want uh, physical? But then they got used to it, and they find it even uh, nice and funny that they can stay at home in their slippers and they can learn Latin language courses. And so the same uh, for NGO House. Uh, we need to think uh, what kind of activities uh, in the future we can move online and which should be face to face. For example, NGO House is a place of meeting. And if we only move everything online, then everyone will be sitting anonymously and listening to the seminars and there will not be interaction. It took us a while to uh, get people know that NGO House is a community center. Please come, please uh, do your activities. And now, at the beginning of the project, uh, we had the uh, issue uh, that uh, the premises were not filled at the beginning or in the in the first part of the day. But now, while we started implementing this project, uh, after doing some digitalization uh, of the NGO house, now, for example, you can see which uh, uh, spaces are filled, uh, which spaces are vacant, uh, which rooms you can still occupy. And now, even this morning, uh, hours starting to, to become full. So therefore, uh, even for the future, I believe we will, would like to keep the balance. We'll go online, but still nothing can substitute the actual physical meeting of people. Yeah, thank you, Irina. We have some comments on the Facebook that uh, address the lack of access for a lot of people. We have Kate Stewart, uh, who, who mentions from Liverpool that there's a lot of people who don't have access to to Wi-Fi and smartphones. So this is something I also see in my neighborhoods uh, that we, we, uh, we heard the news that uh, you know, all the schools had to move online, uh, all the education, but in this neighborhood, this particular neighborhood, uh, there's a lot of very poor families who might have one smartphone per family with three, four kids. So this is a very big issue. I mean, this is more timely than ever to think a little bit about the digital gap. Uh, but let's move on a little bit to, to our spaces and, and I would like to invite Petra. Petra, you are the only one among us who's sitting in, uh, not at home, but in your second home, that is the Lazaretti, uh, Lazaretti cultural venue platform. No? Uh, how would you describe the Lazaretti and what is happening there now in these days? Well, um... I would describe Lazaretti as empty now, unfortunately, but what we are doing here is uh, what we've all, always um, uh, done with the premise that uh, we only need, uh, we need only to uh, make a um, social cultural center in Lazaretti, but to make connections with the local community. This is something that is also true for the youth center, for example, which is also um, dealing with uh, probably more of uh, youth uh, topics and STEAM and IT topics, but it's always the same. So with this uh, premise, uh, what we try to do in this quarantine uh, times is that we um, that each and every uh, one of the NGOs who are working either in the Lazarity complex or the youth center uh, decided to give uh, the best of their knowledge to the local community in these times. So we had, for example, 3D printing of the um, uh, protective shields for the doctors or the protective masks. Uh, we have uh, young uh, psychologists and youth workers who are always online and on phone giving, uh, for example, psychological help to those who need it. Uh, then we have education workshops online and everything is just uh, transforming uh, into a virtual uh, area. Um, so we've given basically, we just continued on working uh, only online and in a virtual uh, community. For example, this things that are uh, behind me is also something that we started be before the quarantine uh, times. It's a participatory exhibitions and all these objects are basically given to us, uh, lended to us by uh, people who wanted to, to show them uh, to the entire community and tell their own personal stories about it. These are not very valuable things. They do not have to be items that are very valuable, but are very uh, sentimental in a way. They have their stories, their memories attached to it, etc. So what we did was, because we can't do it anymore in uh, uh, offline um, 
space, we've just transferred it to online space because we figured that a lot of people in the last uh, several weeks started um, uh, uploading their old pictures, their old memories, and just it, it was some kind of a defense mechanism uh, to go back to the past and to think about all the lovely memories they had. So what we did is we just continued on working with them and uh, made them upload uh, their photos and stories in, in a way to just uh, feel them more comfortable, feel their, uh, make them feel just uh, like everything is okay. So basically that's it. We do not work anymore in a physical space, unfortunately, but we've uh, some by this project and by other projects, we also worked in the last um, year and so on uh, just making connections and networking with our local community, which is around uh, these uh, two centers, Lazarity Complex and Youth Center. Uh, unfortunately, since uh, the economy of uh, Dubrovnik is very unstable right now because of the lack of tourism, um, uh, we are in a very uh, economically unstable times right now. So we are okay uh, by, by financial means for this year, but we are very aware that next year it will be much harder for these centers uh, to work. And I really hope that by the efforts that NGOs are doing and by their volunteering and by their professional work, uh, it will help us uh, to show the city and Croatia that these spaces are indeed very valuable to the local community. And I think that uh, what happened was with the, through the Active NGOs project is that a lot of networking uh, happened. So we are supporting each other here in the Zarity Complex and Youth Center as well. So we are planning together what we will do in the future and how to survive in the future. Thank you, Petra. This is very interesting what you say about the economic pressure, economic uh, uh, situation, because what we remember from the last economic crisis a bit more than 10 years ago, that uh, many NGOs and civil society actors stepped in and they created their own, uh, in many cities or many, many countries in Europe, they created their own social welfare networks. No? They created the social nets that actually maintain a lot of people and families and social groups that otherwise wouldn't have made it. Um, only with the help of uh, states or maybe also municipal-led uh, welfare networks. And then a few years later, when the economy was you know, exploding and the, the market was back again, then many of these NGOs and, and civil society actors were forgotten. So it's actually very important to show in these moments of crisis how important these uh, initiatives are, like in the Lazaretti, Years ago, you were, I guess, under pressure from tourism. Everything was about tourism. Tourism was seen as the, you know, the uh, golden egg, the, the, you know, the ultimate revenue uh, for Dubrovnik, even if there was a lot of reinvestment into culture. So you also benefited this, but also it had a very strong pressure on real estate and real estate and spaces are, of course, you know, indispensable elements of any kind of community venues. So um, it's very important now that you actually are the one remaining and the tourists are not there to somehow reaffirm your space and your, your, your position in maintaining these networks. So that's, I, I think, very interesting for us. I think by uh, our tradition, uh, because a lot of people will still uh, remember what happened after the Homeland War, and a lot of these NGOs actually stepped in where the state was supposed to step in, but couldn't at that time, for example, the humanitarian purposes or cultural purposes, etc. So I think um, NGOs in this case and uh, NGO houses are more flexible. Uh, they work on the field with people to just step in and to get uh, past all the bureaucratic stuff and just to act in a proper way at the appropriate time. This is something that is also an added value to uh, each and every case of our NGO houses, I think. Thank you, Petra. I would move over to Jackie, who's uh, a trustee of Belta, the Bristol Estate Leaseholders and Tenants Association. And you're also, uh, I think, very much connected to or managing or co-managing a community hub in the, in the Bristol Estates that is a part of... Uh, East Brighton. So if you can tell us a little bit about this space and then we will ask Tom uh, of how this specific venue is located in the broader ecosystem of East Brighton. And Jackie, if you could tell us a little bit how is this community hub doing right now? 
Sure. Um, well, just a little bit about the hub. So it's um, located centrally on the Bristol estate. It's a smallish building. It has a kitchen. Up until this point, it's been used by the community for drawing classes, yoga classes, for local counsellors to hold surgeries. So it ha it's a multi-purpose space. Um, on the Bristol estate, there's also seven artist studios. I'm actually an artist. Uh, trustee, so I'm kind of uh, crossing over um, different areas of, of uh, activity. Um, everything has happened very suddenly, so we've had to adapt really, really quickly. Um, we can't use the space as such because of physical social distancing, although the space is being used. Um, we've sort of taped it off. It's been used primarily as um, an emergency food distribution centre. So what we've got are some incredible volunteers, and I think maybe Tom has got um, uh, an image of some of the volunteers, and we've very quick, quickly mobilised uh, both resident volunteers and volunteers from around the city. We have um, a team of chefs who are coming in, um, a team of cleaners, we have people preparing food parcels, and we are trying to meet the need of residents. It's um, really resonance, uh, it uh, resonates what you've been saying there about digital connection, because one of the issues for us is, does every, is everybody able to connect with us remotely? Um, we actually did a flyer drop. We physically handed out flyers and uh, volunteers delivered them to each flat, uh, which isn't the safest thing to do because of, of course it has a physical surface quality to it. Um, but we did find that a lot of people responded. They found the flyer, they understood that the community hub was supporting the residents and they started um, sending us food orders and telling us about their needs and we tried to meet them. Um, in terms of quickly mobilizing a remote office, we've been, we use G Suite. So we've now got this physical office space. The volunteers have an office, community food has an office. Um, and that in itself has been an, an incredible challenge, but it's been um, such a learning curve for everyone. We're training people up. Uh, we're recognizing the volunteers, they, they're making, enormous contribution. I mean, it's so heartening, actually. It's really heartening what's happening. What, what made your community hub, uh, let's say, uh, such a fast and efficient actor in addressing this crisis? We've been there. It's a beautiful space. There's a mm. kitchen there. So probably this yeah. was a, a help. You had your network. You had the eye and the ears of, uh, of the neighbors. But how, what made it you such a, you know, an actor that was able to step up in this situation, maybe faster than the municipality, faster than other actors. What are the, the ingredients of, of such a fast action? Um, it's interesting and it's something that we will have to reflect on ourselves really. I think there were some key stakeholders. So we've got good connection with the council. We have, um, formerly we had a veg and a fruit provision at um, East Brighton, and that's been revived through the East Brighton Food Co-op. So we had some key players there who could quickly step up and start to fill the gaps um, as the as government, local government, as everyone was trying to adapt to the situation. Because you know, as you'll probably be aware, we went from um, you know, we very quickly moved into social distancing, so, and taking more extreme isolation measures. So, um, yes, I think it's, it's really helped that some, uh, some of the people already involved had those networks established and they could very quickly pull together, we could pull together as a, a small group. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I would ask okay. Tom a little bit, where is this a uh, specific venue is maybe different from others. How did other venues in this Brighton area uh, are mobilizing themselves? If you can describe a little bit the, the overall area so that our listeners have a better Of course. Picture. So the area of which we're, uh, of which the Active NGOs project is, is uh, focused upon uh, in the local context is uh, an area called East Brighton. Uh, it's about seven and a half thousand um, residents and they comprise three key neighbourhoods. So Bristol Estate, which Jackie has been speaking about, 
White Hawk and also Manor Farm. And there are around 12 community assets um, across, those, across that, th that, um, those communities. Um, I would say that um, the Bristol Estate and the Belter, the, the trustees behind that and their mentality has meant that they are further ahead in, in term, and, and they were a lot quicker to act and in a much more um, personal, personalized and community focused way than other um, NGOs, uh, NGO houses in the, in the area. I think they're ongoing, there's issues of trust and um, difficult collaboration taking place between different groups. Um, and also th there's, there's those, as Jackie said, there's those networks. And if you don't have particularly around food distribution, if establishing um, a, a, a connection with a food distributor at this time is incredibly difficult. Um, and everyone in the city is wanting those contact details and those that food, those essentials. So um, it's it, it, part of it is supply and demand. Um, but I think what the uh, where Bristol Estate have been fantastic, in particular, has has really known their area of need. And and like Jackie said about knowing their residents, their neighbours, that not all of them have got access to um, digital means, or even if they do, they don't have sufficient data on their phones or their tablets to access them um, and with lots of people losing their jobs or uh, you know money is very tight um, so uh, they know they know their demographic and they responded very closely to that and I think that's where NGOs can really as Petra said can adapt to very low hyper local issues and needs whereas um, as a municipality of which I work within it was very much the vastness of the of COVID-19, how do we respond in, you know, from every aspect of, of our um, of civic life, public life. Uh, and so understandably, there's going to be bureaucracy. We're hearing, you know, we're hearing from our um, central government, from our Public Health England, day on day, somewhat conflicting um, statements and advice and guidance. Whereas um, I think groups like Belta were very quick to say well this is what we need to do to help the people that live near us and, and around us um, and so I feel like the army municipality has, has, has been learning a lot in the last 10 days um, and I hope uh, that it will mean from my perspective we are more we're thinking more of a blended approach in terms of listening to our communities acknowledging their expertise um, range of skills um, and the other thing which is really really key is that the demographic of activists has changed fundamentally in the last two weeks many of the um, I'd say community stakeholders are of an age or an age demographic where they are having to self-isolate under the guidance so now that we are seeing a a new, a, a, a new generation or a, a, a different different kind of cohort of, of activists and people um, able and willing and wanting to support their communities who've never who've never um, and this is across the city who've never got you know never been to an evening meeting yeah i think we lost tom or at least i lost um, to talk about their you know their local crime and community safety but actually they, they want to help their they they, they want to help they want to help at this time of crisis um, and that said anything from single roads setting up a whatsapp group to bigger things like belter and and beyond right so what we see is the emergence of uh, stronger and richer local ecosystems that can give very quick responses to certain certain events which can be a pandemic but it can also be eventually a, a, another natural disaster or a climate crisis or different situations so I think this this is a very good lesson for us uh, and for municipalities we work with how to you know empower and and give new capacities to these these networks I would move over to Espo um, or Helsinki um, just a little bit to talk about when what happens when we don't have maybe one space like in Riga mm. But we have a set of spaces scattered around in a city, which also is a quite fragmented urban mm -hmm. area. But there's a quite strong coordination of how NGOs and you know social enterprises can work together in this this area. 
if you can tell us a little bit about this ecosystem that you've been helping to build as a uh, your official title NGO cooperation coordinator yes. um, how does it look like in s and how do they react to this situation now yeah as I say I'm physically in Helsinki but mentally I'm in Espo so I work for the municipality and and I work very closely with NGOs so I kind of see the both sides very well and as you Levante said, said you we have many different uh, houses, NGO houses, not just one, and many different NGOs working. Uh, and our local uh, group that works in this NGO project is very active. And we have a lot of uh, civil workers, but also, uh, also NGO members. And I'm really, really proud of the both sides here in, in Espo because the NGO field reacted so fast. They were like announced at that from now on, you're not allowed to open your doors. And a few days later, there were online chats and online Discord uh, uh, sites and people were using Zoom and, and calling to their normal uh, like clients, if you can say. People who used to come to their places and like helping people with um, like filling out papers or paperwork, like from a window, like staying safe, but people sitting outside and the worker being inside and using the window as a place to work. And then the municipality, like usually it, everything takes a lot of time because of course it's a big, big city and uh, things have to move in a certain way but i think the municipality has to react now we cannot wait and discuss and have workshops and think about uh, how we're going to do this and what is allowed because we know people are in need right now not in a year or so so um, also the municipality has to react and i think because we are we have been building this community of uh people and building trust and uh, kind of building these structures uh, to work with the NGO field. So I think it has been something that everyone saw as something natural that we have to solve problems. Let's do it together. So we have seen everything has been solved together with the municipality and with NGOs. So the food distribution it's a hard word to pronounce, uh, uh, has been this common thing with the NGO. Uh, first, there was um, the first uh, uh, service for, for elderly people for over 70 years old who have to be in self-isolation or in quarantine. So they cannot go and buy the food. So they decided that people have to call their number. That is a municipality number. but uh, an NGO, AU, is uh, having all these volunteers. So they are doing the actual work. So it goes from one number to one NGO who then spreads, spreads to work to many different volunteers and NGOs. So I think that is a really good example. And another one is uh, the one that I've been very busy with uh, because we have a lot of foreign pe speaking people in ESPO. And I think I'm not sure whether you have heard the news from Sweden that there has been a problem that foreign speaking communities are not getting information about the virus and they're yeah. not uh, uh, aware of the regulations. So there have been a lot of deaths, deaths in those communities percentage wise. And um, we in ESPO, we don't want to have that same situation. We want to uh, help everyone even though they don't speak Finnish or Swedish or English. Uh, so we've been building this phone help desk service. It started yesterday and we have uh, people giving the service from NGOs and from munic municipality and all over the municipality. So not just one department. So we have now, I think, 25 people answering the phone in 15 languages plus uh, like clear Finnish. 
So this was done in a few weeks time, building this whole thing. And as I said, it started yesterday and I'm still slightly excited and tired of <laughs> making all this process that. come true. But it was clear for everyone that we will do this together. So I think that is one really amazing example of people coming together as workers. And there's some volunteers as well working there. But I think we have also had this problem that you have to do this kind of digital jump really fast. And many NGOs have done that. But then there's people like elderly who do not use these different kind of Zooms and Adobe contacts and Google Meets and so on. <laughs> so uh, the NGO houses that we have, the workers have been calling to people, just calling and talking and they actually said that now they have finally time to meet, really meet these people and hear their needs. So some, were, some of their workers were really happy for this opportunity that you don't now have 10 people asking you something at one time because you called just to one person. So they are having a real connection with the clients. So I think that is also really interesting point uh, that now you actually meet people in a real way when you're not in a large group so that has been also a really interesting side of this crisis yeah thank you maria um we've entered in the last 15 minutes of this conversation so i would encourage everyone who's following us on facebook live uh to ask your questions now we have a few comments that i will I will throw in the discussion after hearing a bit about uh, from Mark uh, about the Santa Pola situation, because also in Santa Pola we talk about the series of buildings, series of spaces that yes. constitute in a way this local civic ecosystem. Now starting from like cultural centers through elderly homes as well, surprisingly, yeah. and other venues. So how how is the situation in this sense in Santa Pola? How do these spaces deal with this? changing situation. Yeah, here in Santa Pola, as you said, we have uh, the local civic center and La Seña. Both are the main structures that uh, provide support services and physical spaces to host uh, associations. And unfortunately, at this moment, uh, both are, are closed. Uh, as uh, well, one of the typical uh, things of Santa Pola here, at least in our association network, is we have very small NGOs. We have very small uh, associations, very most of them are, are very aged and uh, not very familiar with, uh, with new technologies. So we are facing uh, important difficulties to, to still working with, uh, with quite uh, normality. But uh, despite this, uh, both the, the city council and the, and the NGO house are trying to, to adapt uh, their activity and try uh, to make an, an important communication, uh, communication effort. So this is the case, especially of the of the of the local uh, uh, the local social services, which are located at the at the civic center, uh, which is trying to implement a system to to attend people through through internet, no, through through distance. So um, this is a, a good example. We also have uh, our youth uh, our youth base, uh, the Rakojova, also located in the in the civic center that has promoted to. To interesting uh, initiatives through through social media, as uh, as hope from balcony, which is a, a weekly challenge, a, a weekly challenge through through Instagram, in which people can share creative and funny pictures from their home. Or uh, also, we have uh, music at home, which uh, every Friday afternoon, uh, four local uh, uh, artists uh, perform a live show on on Facebook pages. Uh, and also the, the city council has uh, has put has made available an, an information number and uh, and email to attend uh, these uh, these NGOs and to solve their their jobs. So I think at the end uh, we think this, uh, these situations uh, also represent uh, uh, an opportunity to make this uh, this this digital step forward and uh, to test uh, new communication uh, mechanism. So uh, we'll see. In a way, it's also an opportunity for you to introduce mm -hmm. maybe new means of communication, new channels with 
your audience and also to in a way entertain the community around now to sure. have them involved in in uh, you know sending messages to each other putting things on the back and is so in a way you try to keep these people on board to to follow us and, and stay with us because this is one of the the last questions i would like to to address to all of you a little bit in in the sense that uh, we heard about what can you do if you have a space uh, if you're allowed to still have people to cook to create a, you know food delivery starting from that space um, you can uh, in a way uh, do the, the virtual exhibitions like in lazaretti um, I heard from Jackie in, a, in, a, in an email before that they're considering using some parcels of the garden to provide space for, for families for a few hours to you know, safely let people out in a controlled way, but spend time in, in outside because it's, 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 people can go crazy if they spend all this time inside. No? And, and many people don't have access to any, any green space. So some of these things you can do with your own infrastructure, but some of these things uh, you are uh, you can invite other organizations to do. No, we heard from uh, from Lazaretti that some of the organizations in your network, in your ecosystems, they are they switch their three D printers to to print uh, you know um, breathing masks, uh, oxygen uh, masks. Uh, for hospitals and other reasons. So there's been a lot of activities around uh, around you in your ecosystems that maybe it's not driven by you, but other organizations around you. So my question would be, and this is also what Bahanul from the audience is asking that, uh, how can you support you as NGO houses, you as networks that bring together these uh, individual organizations, how can you encourage them to to, to uh, engage in this kind of solidarity activities? What kind of support can you give to them, and also maybe if you have some examples that are interesting from your cities to share with us, it would be really interesting because we are in this international space of uh, we're trying to learn from each other. And I guess there's been a lot of discussion in the last weeks between us as well, and between a lot of other cities. Now, what can we learn from each other? What are the good um, methods? What are the good ways for municipalities, but also for local civic society, local civic ecosystems to address the crisis. By the way, Urbect uh, has its own uh, inventory of this kind of initiatives as well. So this is also another resource we can look at. So this is a question to all of you. Uh, how can you support your, uh, your member organizations in your ecosystem? And what are the, maybe the most ex exciting solidarity practices around this? Anyone oh, can maybe, jump in. Maybe I can, I can start uh, to keep the tradition. Uh, in case of Riga, in case of Latvia, there are several initiatives uh, uh, with the main idea to help people who are staying at home and who are not able to buy food uh, uh, to get the food to them. For example, um, there are two organizations, uh, Red Cross and another one uh, in cooperation with the Welfare Department of Riga City Council. Uh, they are helping to provide the volunteers for doing this job. For example, there are people in the service uh, which are uh, monitored by the social service uh, of Riga and, uh, and these organizations are helping to get the volunteers. Uh, it's not so easy task because uh, the volunteers need to be checked. Uh, uh, so because uh, no, the food is not provided for free, you actually have to pay for it. But, uh, you, uh, but you need to find the people who are doing this. And uh, this initiative is also on a bigger scale uh, made by several NGOs, state institutions, and also private enterprises. So there is a website, Palyatsmaya uh, Selve, it's uh, equivalent of stayathome.lv. And it's a platform for volunteers uh, who can register. You need to you can download the application form. Uh, you register, you provide your data. And then uh, the people who need their help, they can call and leave information that they need the help in getting food. And this is the platform for bringing both volunteers uh, who are providing data about them uh, to have a safe environment so that you don't get the money to someone and he or she disappears with this. And so these people are bringing um, uh, food to the people either elderly or who are in the lockdown. Down. And how we are trying to do, we're trying to inform about these initiatives as much as we can. We're using social media 
We're using also webinars and, for example, after the Easter, we're having uh, our next uh, local group meeting. It's called ULG, Urbac Local Group Meeting. And uh, this uh, meeting will be chaired by the author of this initiative, stayathome.lv, uh, who will help us both to, to, to understand how to survive in these digital jungles, but not only a technical means how to do it, but also how to plan your time, how to cooperate between each other and also to share the information about this initiative. So now they have covered almost all Latvia with volunteers who are trying to help each other and they're still looking for volunteers in some parts. So we are doing all our best to promote these good initiatives and to spread them around. Thanks, Ladirina. Anyone else wanting to jump in here? I'm sure there are a lot of amazing initiatives in your cities. I, I can jump in if you like. Um, I think there's there's a couple that really spring to mind, both with NGOs and municipality. I think um, I, I live below a, a young child, uh, parents of a young child, and uh, our library our libraries team are doing story time online, and so you can watch it live on Facebook Live, or you can watch it at a time when your your small toddler or child is awake. Um, and there's um, lots of different stories are being told by different members of the library team in their in their lounges, so it feels very familiar. Um, I think one of the other things that have co has come up just today from Parklife, who is uh, who are members of our Urbac local group, they are um, planning and uh, because we have Easter coming up, and traditionally uh, an Easter egg hunt is sort of part of kind of uh, the the celebration of Easter. That there there will be a virtual Easter egg hunt. So I'm, I'm now a member. Pokemon Go. Yes, a kind of I I I I've not had a chance to look at the details of it, but um, I'm intrigued to see what they are doing. And they've created a list of 30 things to to look out for nature whilst you're whilst you're quarantined. So bird watching and um, uh, other things. Um, the other thing I wanted to share was uh, the uh, we have um, the rainbow. Mm -hmm. So on my street, because I, I uh, my window is here, lots of people st stop at my door, uh, stop at my window whilst I'm working, often on Zoom, uh, and are counting the amount of rainbows in the streets. Uh, so that's quite nice. And again, it, it's it's uh, I think it sparks those conversations with neighbours. Um, and I think I don't know if this is happening in other European cities, but every Thursday night at eight o'clock. We have a clap, we applaud our health workers. Um, and it's gone from, it, we've got our next one, our third one will be this Thursday. And uh, last week's, uh, we had pots and pans, trumpets, um, fireworks, cheers, songs, all very um, creative and everyone out in, at their doorway or out of their window. So I think that was really, um, it was quite moving really. Yeah, I just wanted to to give an example from Budapest, a bit similar on, on how to create new conversations in this situation. I'm, I'm part of a foundation called the Hungarian Contemporary Architecture Center. And every year we organize uh, the f celebration of 100 year old buildings. And it's the first weekend of May and it's where buildings are invited to to create uh, all kinds of events in the buildings. Well, communities in the buildings are invited to create events especially telling the stories of, of the buildings no and of course this is not going to happen now so the question was also how to move this online how to invite the people to create online the stories how to create uh, you know a lot of photos and, and kind of report from the buildings but also how to start discussions in these buildings which can be engines of the solidarity networks that we talk about no so in a way, we're, we're all everywhere. We're trying to adopt our, our events, our activities. We have two more questions before we close. That one comes from Juan Arana, who's asking uh, about how collaboration between municipalities and civic, like NGOs and, and uh, civic activists uh, work now. Is it better now than before? Is it worse? Is it smooth? I know because it's an interesting question for us because we are half municipalities and half civil society representatives, sometimes both. Uh, and also another question was a little bit about from uh, Gaetano Molura uh, about the situation of, of the elderly and maybe especially in, in, the, in, in the way that uh, 
of course, the elderly are much more exposed. They're much more vulnerable. Now, as Tom said, uh, instead of an older generation of, of, of activists, there's a younger generation of activists are, are coming in. But maybe if you have other, uh, any comments on how maybe the, the relationship between older generations and younger change or shift or, or maybe are intensified in this, this moment. So these are the two questions. And then after that, we will slowly have to close. Maybe I can uh, try to answer both of these questions. Um, as I've previously told um, in, in, while I was first speaking um, that the economic uh, situation is very hard, especially for the NGOs in the following um, half a year and uh, the whole next year. What uh, we need to do, what we realize that we need to do here in Dubrovnik since I think in the last um, episode of this uh, podcast, uh, you had a um, representative of uh, Clubture from Croatia, and they yeah. did a wonderful job of giving the um, government uh, an estimation of uh, risks and um, all the negative consequence that uh, this uh, COVID situation will have on the civil society and cultural sector. Um, the government is um, doing uh, very well for now uh, when it comes to protecting these uh, work, these workers which work in the civil society. But I think uh, we need to, especially now, work more on educating the importance of the NGOs here in Dubrovnik, so not to be uh, cut up from the budget uh, and to just show our value. Um, and what really um, our work uh, means uh, to the community in whole. Um, when it comes to elderly in our community, as I've mentioned before, we have uh, throughout uh, the districts, we have a lot of volunteers either from Red Cross or either, um, or either from uh, civil protection, um, which um, not only uh, take care of uh, everything that goes on the streets and people uh, obeying the measures and the rules, but also uh, they uh, distribute food and uh, medicine, whatever is um, necessary for uh, the elderly. So what happened is that a lot, a lot of young people are actually stepping into these roles of volunteers and they're really asking the elderly not to go out and uh, it, it just goes from a very informal um, uh, level of uh, you offering help to your neighbors or a for more formal way through Red Cross or through a volunteering organization. So I think in Dubrovnik we, we really did step up as a community and really showed that we really do care about each other. And I think that's one of the main reasons why we have such a low number of people who are infected in, in the end. Thank you very much, Petra. On Facebook, we have also a lot of comments uh, regarding the Santa Pola activities, uh, as well as the ESPO activities. So please take a look at the video on Facebook as well. We also had a comment uh, from Brazil that uh, a little bit responding to Tom's comment about clapping, uh, applauding the health workers. Apparently in Sao Paulo every evening at 8.30 in the evening, there's, uh, they boo the president. So there's, it's also a moment of political dissent, which definitely some people deserve. So I guess it's a moment of uh, you know using our voices and using our positions in the city to to amplify our voices as well. I'm afraid that we will have to close it here. I know it's an infinite discussion, and we would have you know a lot of things to talk about for hours. But uh, I would like to thank you very much for for joining us. I know it's not your first Zoom call today, and not the last one. So we appreciate you took the time. It was really lovely to see you in person that you are doing well, you recovered in some cases. And I would really like to congratulate for the great work you're doing because this is a very important uh, thing that you do. And this is a very, very crucial time to do, to hold together these communities and to support your local NGOs and uh, civil society actors. So thank you very much for uh, being with us. Thank you for everyone who listened to us and followed us on Facebook. The whole video will be also on YouTube uh, in a few hours. 
and we will continue cooperative to sit in quarantine next Friday, the 17th of April, if I'm correct, at 5 p.m. when we talk about tourism, because we see that tourism has been completely transformed. And the question will be what's happening with the spaces of tourism, what happens with the economies of tourism in times of uh, the COVID crisis. So thank you again for joining uh, us. And I hope to speak to all of you very soon. I'm sure we will speak very soon. Thank you.